get started. It's 12.30, so we could probably get okay. started. Okay. Yeah, I'm Kristen Kindred. I am originally from Minnesota, um, and I did my training in the Midwest. Um, I've been in practice for about two and a half years. I first started in practice in Indiana, um, and then I came here about a year ago. So um, today I'm going to talk about total ankle replacements, which is a very kind of small portion of what I do, um, but it is actually one of the most gratifying procedures um, that that's pretty cool. And the technology is really interesting too. So I have some slides that I'll share. If anybody has questions as we go, you can use the like raise hand feature or you can just unmute and and ask questions. Um, looks like a fairly small group of people. So it should be easy to um, ask questions and, and answer them. So, all right. All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is it full screen? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. OK. OK. So um, like Jessica said, I um, did extra training to receive certification to do total ankles as well as um, more complicated hind foot and ankle reconstructive surgery. And I am board certified in foot and ankle surgery. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see a picture of Minnesota. That's where I'm from. And then in the top picture um, are runners. I, I really enjoy running. That's one of my hobbies. And um, I really enjoy keeping patients active one way or another, whether it's surgery or not surgery, injections, things like that. It's it's really important to me to keep keep patients active and you obviously can't walk if you're if your feet hurt or if you have some type of a foot or ankle injury. So ankle arthritis um, is when the cartilage or the protective lining of the ankle joint wears out. It becomes inflamed um, and you get bone rubbing against bone. So normally there's a protective coating over both the talus and the tibia on either side of the ankle joint right here. And so normally those surfaces are smooth and you can, there's like gliding motion that occurs across the joints. Um, but once, once the joint becomes arthritic, that cartilage is damaged and the, it's no longer a smooth surface for those bones to, to glide against each other. And so the more motion you have, um, the more painful it is. And so the ankle, is um, difficult to move and eventually get loss of motion of that joint. There are a bunch okay. of different. Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to interrupt for a second because I think with the slides, I know that I'm hitting the arrows on my own screen to move them forward. Okay. I don't know. It's like not syncing. So I don't know if um, like we all just oh, have to move them forward me... ourselves. OK, here we go. How's that? OK, I think that's good. Can everybody see the ankle arthritis slide? No, no. Yeah, I yes. can. I can. Yeah. 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 Click sync. Yeah. Is it the orange one? Now it's working. Okay. Why it's not working? Try. Which slide are we on? Let me just let me just try sharing this in a different way. Okay. How about this? I think that this will work better. The title of the slide should be "What is ankle arthritis?" Okay. Yeah. Can you guys? That's what I'm saying. Can yeah. you guys see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So here's my okay. introduction slide with the running shoes, and then we talked about what arthritis is. And there's a bunch of different types of arthritis. So it can be arthritis from a metabolic. Um, issue or a systemic issue like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. 
um, but we'll kind of get into the specific type of arthritis that affects the ankle. So ankle arthritis feels like stiffness, pain in the joint. Sometimes it can feel like instability, like the ankle might uh, roll out on you. Um, you can have swelling, warmth, redness around the front of the ankle, which is where the leg and the foot meet each other. Causes of ankle arthritis. The most common cause of ankle arthritis is post-traumatic. So hips and knees can wear out because of just primary osteoarthritis, but that doesn't typically happen in the ankle. And a lot of that has to do with how thick the cartilage is. So the, the cartilage in the ankle is a lot thicker than the cartilage in the knee and the hip. And so it, it doesn't wear out with wear and tear like hips and knees do. It's most often arthritic because there's been some type of a traumatic event that has uh, impacted the cartilage or actually caused like a crack in the cartilage from a, a fracture that's gone into the joint um, or a really bad ankle sprain that causes a chip in the cartilage. Um, and, and that's usually how the cartilage gets damaged. It's usually from some type of a trauma or an injury. And so overall, ankle arthritis is a whole lot less common than hip and knee arthritis. So you probably haven't heard of a lot of people with ankle replacements. And that's simply because ankle arthritis is far less common than hip and knee arthritis. But it does it does still happen um, because people sprain their ankles and break their ankles all the time. So ankle arthritis, you have kind of two ways to go, surgical and non-surgical. So for less severe ankle arthritis, things like ibuprofen, Aleve, um, different inserts or braces, and then even cortisone injections can help minimize pain in the joint. But when the ankle gets to the point where the arthritis is so bad that um, those things don't work anymore, then we start talking about surgery. And there's really two main categories for ankle arthritis surgery. There's either fusion of the ankle, which is called arthrodesis. You actually take the the tibia and the talus, and you fuse them together. Um, and that takes care of the pain because you don't have bone grinding against bone, um, but it does prevent motion of the ankle joint. The other option is a total ankle replacement, which is when you take the arthritic surfaces of the joint and you put um, an implant in there. So these are some pictures of what an ankle fusion and an ankle replacement look like. On the left is an ankle fusion. So this um, woman had a fracture that didn't heal well and she had deformity of the ankle, like her ankle was crooked and arthritic. So I went ahead and fused her ankle. Um, there are a couple of reasons why I chose a fusion for her over a replacement, but the main one for her was that she was she's neuropathic. She can't feel um, her extremities very well. She has neuropathy, um, and neuropathy is actually a contraindication to an ankle replacement, um, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But so this is what an ankle fusion looks like: a plate and screws or how it's typically done. This plate is from her old fracture. I just left it in there. Um, but so that's what a fusion looks like. And then this is what a replacement looks like. So there's metal on the tibia and metal on the talus. And then there's a high molecular weight poly, which is like a fancy plastic piece that sits um, connected to the tibial component and makes it so that there's plastic between the two metal components. So there's smooth motion um, and no grinding of the metal in the joint. So I, I don't know if you guys, can you guys see me as well? Yeah. Yes. I have yes. a little, mo I have a model of what, um, what an ankle replacement looks like. So uh, the tibial component, get out here. 
is it's not usually this long of a stem, but there's diff there's different ones that you can use. But you can see the plastic, the polyethylene piece that's in there, um, and that's what sits against the tailor component and allows for motion of the joint like that. Are you muted? All right, is that better? Yes. Yes. I pressed the space bar to advance my slides and it ended the call. So <laughs> I, think, I, I think we're back. So in dis so there's some discussion about a fusion versus an ankle replacement. So the pros of an ankle replacement are is that the, the implant can bend um, and move. So you, you preserve motion of the ankle, which assists with a more normal gait. And the recovery for an ankle replacement is actually shorter than the recovery for an ankle fusion. Um, and it has to do with just how the bones, what the bone is required to do in an implant versus a fusion. But in as little as six weeks, you can be walking in a shoe after an ankle replacement um, versus a fusion. I keep patients non weight bearing for usually seven or eight weeks after a fusion. With an ankle replacement, the joint moves, and so there's less stress on the surrounding foot joints, which is a helpful thing. Um, and patients are able to wear more shoe options. I would say not really high heels, but um, patients with an ankle fusion, they tend to need a shoe that has more of like a rocker bottom to help accommodate for the lack of motion of the ankle. Um, but that's Patients can still walk normally with an ankle fusion. It's just there's more stress on the other joints in the foot. Um, and patients are happy with both procedures, but they, they're very happy with an ankle replacement if it's at all possible. Okay, so who, who gets the two procedures? If there's two surgical procedures, um, what types of patients get to have um, an ankle replacement versus an ankle fusion. I realize this actually is opposite. So ankle replacements wear out over time. Um, and so basically you want to preserve you want to use an ankle implant in somebody that's older because you don't want the the implant to wear out and have to be replaced during a patient's lifetime. So um, ankle replacements tend to be done in older patients. And the, the definition of older used to be patients over the age of 60 or 70. Um, you're really looking for for an older, like less active type patient. Younger patients, so patients like in their 30s, 40s, and somewhat into their 50s, um, the ankle fusion is a better procedure because it can't fail. Like the ankle implant might have to be replaced, but an ankle fusion would not have to be redone. Um, ways that the ankle implant can fail, so the implant can become loose. So if you have a ton of motion, so someone that does physical labor um, or someone that has neuropathy and can't tell how much they're doing on their lower extremity, the implant can become loose over time and that can cause the implant to fail. And so patients that are really active, so like construction workers, um, heavier patients and patients with neuropathy would be better candidates for um, a fusion. And then lower BMI patients and patients that are active but not high impact activities are better candidates for replacements because the replacement will last longer on um, the kind of less impact that it has on it from, from high activity. So the other category of patients would be deformity uh, patients and then infection. So 
patients that have a severely crooked ankle, like if their ankle is to the point where it's tipped way, way out to one side or another, um, the implant won't sit straight and it will fail. And so patients with severe deformity are better candidates for fusion than replacement. Um, and then patients that have had any infection in the ankle or around the ankle, um, you would opt for a fusion over a replacement because again, it's it's more catastrophic when the ankle replacement fails. Um, and so you're just, you're looking for a patient that you know the implant is gonna do well for a long amount of time. Um, and as the technology has gotten better through the past really 10 years, the the number of patients that are able to have a replacement has has increased. So we're doing these in younger patients with more severe deformities than we used to do previously. So this talks more about, now I'm gonna talk more about the um, ankle replacement process. Like what, how do you end up with this type of thing in your ankle? What do I actually do for you as a patient? So the first thing that we do once we decide we wanna do a total ankle replacement on your ankle is you get a CT scan. And that CT scan scans from your knee all the way down to your toes. And that information gets sent to um, the company that makes the implant. And they create a 3D reconstruction like you see on the left right here of what your ankle looks like and what the mechanical and the anatomic axis of your ankle is. So um, I don't see it in this slide. It says planning your procedure. No, it's the old slide show, showing the difference between the fusion and the replacement. Okay, let me And try actually the whole screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, I can just leave it like this so you can see it. Um, so there's, you can see this is, the company makes a 3D reconstruction of what the ankle looks like. And then they determine what the best alignment of the implant is going to be to function and be the be the best alignment of the ankle that it can be within your body. So they determine that and then they make a plan for how the implant is going to sit within the ankle itself. And then um, I review the plan as the surgeon and can see how the implant is going to sit in the ankle. And um, once I'm kind of happy with how it's going to look, they actually 3D print these pieces. So these white things um, that are used in the surgery to prepare the alignment of the implant. So I have a couple pieces here. So the company that makes the implant 3D prints this, this is actually from a patient that I did this on. So they 3D print the top of the talus and then a cut guide that sits on the top of the talus. So I know that this cut guide is gonna sit just, just right on that talus. Then in surgery, I take the cut guide and I actually put it on the patient and it's the way that it sits on the patient anatomy determines how the implant is going to sit. So you pin this onto the patient and then you're able to make all of your cuts for the implant based off of this patient specific um, instrumentation is what it's called. And then you do the same thing on the tibia. So this is custom to this patient that I did this on and it has a certain way that it sits and then you put this onto the patient tibia and then pin it. And then you, you do the alignment for the tibia based off of that. And the size of the implant and the size of the poly are, are predetermined um, based off of that CT scan and that custom um, plan that the prophecy company makes. So these are some pictures of what the implants themselves look like. So um, the cut guides are these patient-specific components that help me 
prepare the alignment of the implant. But then the implant itself looks like this. So the white thing is the, the poly that sits against the tibial tray and allows for smooth motion across the Taylor component down here. So kind of moving from the left to the right are, are the kind of size of the implants, if you will. So in ankle replacement surgery, you actually have to cut away some bone to make to make room for the implant. So you have to cut away part of the tibia and cut away part of the talus to make room for the implant. And it's best to to take away as little bone as possible. And so the the implants that I'm typically putting in are these smaller implants where you don't have to take away much bone and then you just put the implant in there um, after there's been minimal bone resection. If the implant were to eventually get loose or fail, you have options to go with larger implants where you would take out more bone and put in a longer stem implant um, that would ultimately be more stable but does require more bone resection. So these are more like revision ankle replacements. Um, and this is typically what I'm using as a, as a primary ankle implant. So after surgery, I keep patients non-weight bearing, meaning no weight on the foot for about three weeks. Um, so that's using crutches or a knee scooter, uh, wheelchair for three weeks. And then at about week three, maybe four, I let patients start walking in a walking boot. They can't walk without the boot, but they can walk in the boot. Once patients are in a walking boot, I have them start physical therapy. And we have a physical therapy protocol for how the therapists work, um, work the patient through increasing motion and increasing activity. At week six or seven, patients are allowed to get from the boot into a regular shoe. And they keep doing PT at that point and work on strengthening the ankle. And at that point, I let them start driving. Um, and kind of the long-term restrictions for the ankle replacement is that there's no high impact activities. So I don't want patients with ankle implants running or jumping, um, but they could um, ride a bike, walk, um, like a any anything that you would think of as like lower impact activity, but still they can be active. How about pickleball? <laughs> um, I guess, it depends on how how aggressive that is. I mean, pickleball, there's I've never played, so maybe you can give me more information, but there's a lot of like motion um, and there may be some jumping involved. It's like tennis. You know, yeah. Not quite as much court covered, but similar. Yeah. So Pivot. you're probably running to the ball and pivoting. Mm -hmm. Is that not good? That would be that would be a lot of force and stress on the implant. Um, so I would advise that that patient would modify and either like play at a lower speed. I don't, I don't know if you could do that. Um, just more walking. I guess I'm kind of imagining like if say you were to do step aerobics, you know, you go to a class where they have a step and you're like, they have you hop up onto the step. Well, the low impact modification for that would be to like just step up instead of hopping. Um, so if there's any modifications like that that you could make, um, you could you could make those modifications. But I don't know if it would still be possible to do the sport if you weren't jumping and running. Right. Dr. Peter, can some, oh, sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Can the component invert and evert at all, or is it all plantar and dorsiflexion? The inversion eversion comes from the ankle ligaments themselves. The um, and I guess there is some excursion of the implant. So there's there's some um, kind of inversion eversion that would happen, but it's it's mostly sagittal plane, and the amount of inversion eversion that there is available. Um, it actually comes from how the implant is put in and the the way that the cuts are made. And because the ankle, it's mostly a hinge joint, but there is still some um, 
frontal and coronal plane motion, the, those axis are more subtle. And so that's where the patient-specific instrumentation is really helpful is setting, setting the axis of the implant um, for the appropriate amount of inversion, eversion, and then um, rotation. And there's a lot, there's some ligament balancing that goes in. So after the implant is put in, um, you want to make sure that there's a balance of like the ligaments themselves. So for a patient that has a varus ankle, for example, from chronic ankle instability, um, after the implant is put in, if there's still residual laxity of the lateral ankle ligaments, I would tighten the ligaments at that time. Or similarly, if there was inadequate dorsiflexion because of a tight Achilles, I would lengthen the Achilles at the same time. Um, so there's, there is definitely some soft tissue balancing that goes in after the implant um, has been placed. Were there more questions about the activity restrictions or I guess to follow up with what um, Ellen was asking, patients that end up having an ankle replacement or an ankle fusion, they're in a lot of pain before they have this done. Um, it's not something that they do just because they have a little bit of pain with certain activities. So I'd be willing to bet that someone that's ready to have an ankle replacement may have already stopped playing pickleball or they've kind of modified their activity to some extent already. Um, and the patients that I'm putting these in, they're they're having pain just walking. Um, and so actually this, I was gonna show x-rays of a case that I did. So um, this is an ankle replacement on a patient. She's 56, I believe. So at the younger end of the spectrum for what I would I would like to do for ankle replacements, but she had um, chronic ankle instability, meaning that she had a really bad ankle sprain at one point in her life, and her ankle was was loose to the point where when she walked, it was just unstable. And over time, she started grinding down the cartilage on the, the medial side of her ankle, and there was cartilage damage because of it. And she had um, multiple procedures to try to repair the cartilage with like an ankle scope. Um, she had some different grafting. She had the ligaments repaired, but ultimately she still had pain in the ankle joint. And so after these surgeries, I think it was between the injury, the surgeries, and then when I saw her, it had been roughly three years that she was in pain in her ankle every day. Like she couldn't garden, she couldn't walk. Um, she was mostly living in a boot because that was how she could control her pain. And so I talked to her about different treatment options and we kind of um, explored all the options, but we ultimately decided on an ankle implant for her. And um, this is, I saw her I think about two weeks ago. So she's six months out from her ankle replacement. And because of the ability to walk without pain and the motion in her ankle, um, she's actually lost 30 pounds. She's no longer pre-diabetic um, and she's able to, to garden and walk. And, and for her, that is exactly what she wanted to do. So um, very gratifying for her and me to see that kind of improvement. So this is a little QR code you could scan if you want to learn more about um, the company that makes the implants or um, there's more patient information there too. So that is all I have and I'd be happy to take any questions. How big is the incision, Dr. Kindred? It is probably eight to 10 centimeters and it's on the anterior ankle. So it's, um, I make it between the tibialis anterior and the EHL tendon. Um, it's an anterior ankle incision. This was a hugely gratifying procedure and I was the one trying to treat her and unsuccessfully and she had ongoing symptoms and 
this just solved her problem and uh, it's just very exciting to see this technology available right here and uh, I, have, I have one question as you were presenting um, the it's based on a CT scan most of them they've already worn off the cartilage um, the CT is bone based, so uh, if there's residual cartilage, do you, I'm assuming you ha do you have to kind of curet off the, all the cartilage so that it fits, or is it generally just fits uh, anyway? So the the CT scan plans for the height of the cartilage that's left. Um, the way that the the way that the technology works, it, it plans for, I can show you more specifically, but like it plans for how much bone you'll have to like under or over resect based on the amount of cartilage that's left. I think there's there's some assumptions because the CT scan does only show the bones, but, but there is space in the joint based on how much cartilage is left. Um, and then when you're when you're putting the guides on, the guide fits onto the bone with no soft tissue. So like the guide is is meant to fit when there's no soft tissue on the bone. So um, when I'm putting the guide on the the patient anatomy, I'm very careful that like I'll take a bovi and actually just bovi off kind of the anterior neck of the of the talus to make sure that there's no ligament attachments there. Um, but you you do want to leave the little osteophytes intact on the bone because that's how the the reed of the um, 3D block sits. You know, it sits based on the patient anatomy, including any little osteophytes. Um, so there is a careful removal of the soft tissue to get the guide to sit on the bone correctly. But I don't I don't prep the joint like you would think of to remove the cartilage for a fusion. Um, the rest of the cartilage is taken away when you use the saw to resect the um, do the bone cuts. Thank you so much for doing this presentation and for bringing this exciting technology to Northwestern Medical Center. It's just it's very gratifying and exciting. It's it's fun. I like doing it. Can you can you post that QR code again? Oh sure. Yeah. Let me. I just um. And I the bar the um I don't know what to call it but the um utility bar is blocking my view. Is there a way to oh, mute it or? Let's or? see. Does that help? Well, the QR code is behind the bar. I don't know how to get rid of the bar. Which shows oh. when I mute or unmute or video. The you could move, drag it, and move it. Or the mm -hmm. website is moverite.com, and right is spelled W-R-I-G-H-T. So I can um, put the put the link in the chat for you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Kindred. This was wonderful to hear about. And we did record the presentation, so we'll have um, a copy of it that people can access. That's good. Thank I'll, you. I'll see you on for a few minutes. Hi, Carolina. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, and I should add our next webinar that's coming up is going to be Amy Brewer, and she's talking about vaping. Great. I think we're good. Carolina, Thank you so love, much. I would love to offer you this implant, but we've talked about it. Yeah, I know. I I just thought I'd look at it just in case, you know, someday they make some in 